Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree, I want to hear a story from the fat electrician. Uh, oh. Yeah, it's a little late for Christmas, but didn't stop y'all from requesting this. Oh, boy. So, yeah, the eggnog riot at West Point. Yeah. It, <laughs> what's, the one, what's one of the worst things you can do whenever uh, dealing with uh, military personnel who are kind of, sort of, wanting to fight, but yet aren't really able to fight? Give them alcohol. Oh, I was going to say put on a uniform and pretend to be a military Oh, guy. oh. <laughs> no, because then you'll just have Vanos look at you just yelling, Stolen Valor! Stolen Valor! Yeah, I've seen those videos. Not just Vanos, it's everybody. No, I know, and I'm, I'm joking. Nobody but... respects people that do that shit. I agree, 100%. Uh, here's the thing. West Point is one of the most famous military like institutes out there. And apparently... You know, giving a bunch of, giving a bunch of like, high-strung military men, a bunch of uh, eggnog, alcoholic eggnog, wasn't the best thing to do. I mean, I've I've heard horror stories about it. And, uh, I would have easily rioted if they gave me eggnog and it wasn't alcoholic. So I <laughs> mean, it was kind of a lose-lose situation, I guess. That's true, but the eggnog riot. At West Point, uh, I've heard horror stories about, like, whenever, uh, at, like, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina or in, uh, or at Guantanamo or, uh, what's the one in California? I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but it, basically, there's spots of, like, military installations that are infamous for, like, their soldiers being a little bit crazy. In which... I mean, these these men are basically put like put in the barracks and are told like, "Hey, <clears throat> we're gonna train you for X amount of weeks, and at the end of that, you're gonna be shipped off to war, uh, like probably." And honestly, that's a lot, dude. That's a lot to put a kid through, especially like a young kid, like like eighteen, nineteen years old, and may maybe they did. JROTC or ROTC and all that, you know, just like, you know, get a little bit of the the idea of what they're getting themselves into. But, I mean, it's a lot to deal with. And mental health is, I think, very important to stress whenever it comes to, like, being in the military. Uh, people who I've heard talk about, you know, Jocko Willink, uh, Tim Kennedy, you know, people who've been in the military for, like, 20 plus years all say the exact same thing it's like mental health is very very important especially to soldiers after they're out of you know you know they're out of combat and they're home and you know that and it's That's just where our government fails them completely from yes most of the time from what i hear well yeah because our government as soon as they're done using them it's just like good luck it's like here's sort of semi free health care but only at select hospitals and only when we feel like it. It's ridiculous, man. Absolutely ridiculous. But Fat Electrician is going to tell us about the eggnog riots at West Point. So uh, this is a military Christmas story. So you're getting a little bit of a late, 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 late Christmas present with this one. So we're going to check it out and see what he's got to say. And it's, I guess, uh, shall we? Let's mm -hmm. go. It was the night before Christmas and all the cadets at West Point got hammered, destroyed their barracks, and tried to kill several of their instructors. That Today we're talking about one of the greatest military Christmas <laughs> stories of all time, the West Point Eggnog Riot of 1826. But first a word from our sponsor, this video is brought to you by the greatest sporting goods store retail location on the planet, Shields. And if you don't live near one, they have an even better online store that's got satisfaction guaranteed and price matching, I so make sure to go check them out. And then of course we have one of our newer sponsors, hmm. Permasafe. They are industrial strength disposable gloves, you can put like a gallon of water inside these things, they still won't break. That's quality jiggling right there. If you actually work with your hands, you need some Permasafe rubber gloves, okay? You're just trying to get 40 hours on your paycheck. You're not trying to go home and give your wife a UTI. Keep your hands clean with Permasafe disposable gloves. Now, you're gonna feel some pressure. I mean, back to the video. 
All right, important background info. West Point, the prestigious military academy, was created in 1802, and from 1802 to 1817, it was a complete shit show. It had a terrible reputation for being complete and utter chaos pretty much all of the time. Cadets were allowed to come and go as they pleased, and then when they did show up, they were too preoccupied drinking or dueling one another to actually learn how to become effective military officers. Hmm. Cue this man, Colonel Slyvanus Thayer. He's going to be hired as superintendent in 1817, and he's going to turn this ship around. He's going to come up with all kinds of radical rules and because of this he is regarded as the father of West Point and when I say radical rules it was basically just him pointing out obvious shit that we shouldn't be allowed to do anymore like get drunk all day kill each other in duels and you actually have to show up to class the hardest of these rules to enforce was a no drinking because there was three places to buy alcohol in very close proximity Sounds to like West Point. Party they had North Cooper. Tavern, which was pretty much on West Point. <laughs> then you have this little general store type deal ran by a guy by the name of Benny Haven and his wife Laleda. And then right across the Hudson, you had Martin's Tavern. So Thayer and his war on alcohol buys the building that North Tavern is in, kicks them out and turns it into a hospital. Then he instructs Benny Haven and his wife to no longer sell alcohol to any of the cadets. The only tavern left after that is Martin's Tavern, but that's across the Hudson River, so he just leaves a guard on sentry duty at the dock where the boats are 24-7 to keep any cadets from going over to that tavern. That's it. The alcohol problem is solved. Or so they thought, you see, because Benny Haven over here is one of the boys. He was a veteran of the War of 1812, so he keeps selling alcohol under the table, hush hush, to all the cadets. This goes on for a couple years, and then Thayer finally catches Benny and his wife selling alcohol, kicks them off the West Point campus, and the rumor is they are the only two people to ever receive a lifetime ban from the military academy now Damn. at this point benny and his wife have essentially lost their job and their home pretty much anybody would be begging for forgiveness and promising not to do it again but benny and his wife laleda are the number one supporting characters in this story because they decide that they're going to buy a fishing shack right on the hudson river right outside of west point oh. where all the cadets could get to them benny's new tavern though is only accessible from two different routes you have to either get there by a boat on the hudson river or you have to crawl down a 60 foot steep cliff side that has stone stairs carved into it meaning that it is treacherous yeah. for pretty much anybody especially if you're drunk and whether benny intended it to be this way or not this actually discourages pretty much anybody except for a bunch of cadets that are trying to avoid from being caught from drinking at his tavern so his tavern is essentially just west point cadets all the time the only problem with that is that the west point cadets don't actually make any money so benny decides he's going to give everybody a year-long tab and he's willing to let them pay off their tab in barter and the only thing he's not willing to accept is West Point military uniforms. He accepts everything else, including their shoes. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that a grizzled veteran from the War of 1812 has opened up a bar right outside of West Point, and all the cadets can go there, get drunk, and pay for it with shit that they've stolen. I mean, strategically transferred to his location. So obviously, <laughs> all the cadets love this guy. He's probably the most influential bartender in American history. Any big military name from that era that went through West Point was friends with Benny Haven. Ulysses S. Grant homeboys even edgar Allan poe is quoted as saying that benny was the only congenial soul in that godforsaken place so that's the deal that's, <laughs> that's where awesome. everybody goes to drink and get their alcohol it's from benny haven's tavern except for the two times a year where the cadets are actually allowed to drink on campus and that is fourth of july and christmas fast forward fourth of july 1826 all the cadets are drinking on campus openly because they're allowed to because it's fourth of july and they get absolutely hammered at which point they decided that they were going to perform a snake dance i have no idea what that is but apparently at the end of it they ran over picked up the commodore of west point major william worth carried him off to the barracks because they liked the guy so much they wanted to kidnap him so they could go drink with him because of this superintendent thayer decides that they went too far and that there's just going to be no more drinking ever again at west point fast forward later that year december 22nd 1826 it's almost christmas and for the first time since west point's inception the cadets are not going to be allowed to throw a Christmas party on Christmas Eve and have everybody get hammered on eggnog. So obviously they're going to do it anyways and just try not to get caught. But I mean, worst case scenario, they do get caught. What's really going to happen? You'll be shot for this? No, I don't think so. More like chewed out. I've been chewed out before. Some of the cadets yeah. sneak off and they go across the Hudson River to Martin's Tavern oh, where they can get a better deal on buying a bunch of alcohol and their goal is to get at least half a gallon of whiskey for the eggnog. That being said, anything worth doing is worth overdoing, so naturally they end up with two gallons of whiskey and they get caught by the guard on the way oh, back, no. a private by the name of James Dugan, and they end up bribing him with 35 cents to look the other way. Next day, December 23rd, all the cadets Damn. are still stealing food and anything okay. else they want for this party. While that's going on, the staff have their Christmas party at 
Christmas, it's at sense. this Christmas party that Thayer decides that he's like, going to be a pretty cool guy. He knows that, that the much. cadets are going to drink yeah. tomorrow, but he's just going to turn a blind eye. He's not going to increase the amount of guards or the amount of staff on duty. He's just going to look the other way. He's going to have the same old two officers on staff making sure everything's okay. He knows they're going to drink. They can drink. Let them think they got away with it. It'll be fine. So that gets decided. And the next order of business is to figure out what they're going to do with the class fuck up Jefferson Davis. Yeah. Like as in the president the, of the Confederacy yes. in the future at this point. Apparently he has quite the drinking problem and he's not very slick about it because he has a distinct honor of being the first student to ever be arrested for going to Benny's Tavern. And he just got back from being hospitalized for four months because the second time he got caught at Benny's Tavern, he tried to make a getaway and ended up falling down the 60 foot cliff oh. on the stone stairs to get there. And he's been hospitalized ever since. And he Damn. just got back to class. Ugh. Fast forward again, December 24th, Christmas Eve, day of the party during the day. Day, all the cadets are going out they're buying all the fresh eggs all the fresh milk from the local farmers some of them go over to Benny's Tavern. They end up buying an extra gallon of moonshine in case the two gallons of whiskey aren't enough. Oh my and God. his wife, Loleta, also makes him a bunch of mutton, which they're going to take back to the barracks and heat in the middle of the night as a drinking snack while they're getting drunk on eggnog. Eggnog and mutton, which is disgusting to think about all right fast forward a couple yeah, hours everybody's been released Ugh. for the day they're all hanging out at the barracks it's nighttime it's time to get this party started they break out the wooden buckets they start mixing the eggs and the milk and the booze to make their eggnog the two officers that are in charge of everybody captain ethan hitchcock and lieutenant william thornton are going to bed at like 11 midnight that's when the party's really going to start and that's pretty much exactly what happens hitchcock and thornton go to bed and then everybody else just kind of starts drinking quietly in their barracks rooms amongst themselves hanging out in the hall having a good time and that Naturally, as the night goes on, things get a little bit louder and a little bit louder as everybody gets drunker and drunker. And finally, at 4 a.m., Captain Hitchcock is awoken by a bunch of noise. So Captain Hitchcock gets up out of bed. He's going to go investigate, but he knows exactly what he's going to find. This dude's been in the Army his whole life. He knows it's just a bunch of cadets drinking on Christmas Eve. It's not really that big of a deal. All he's going to do is he's going to go find the first group he can, tell them to be quiet. They're going to tell everybody else, and everything's going to be completely fine. So that's exactly what he does. He goes upstairs to the first of many barracks rooms. It has a bunch of cadets drinking inside of it, pokes his head in the door and is like, hey, shut the fuck up and go to bed. And they're like, cool, our bad. And he leaves. He goes back to his room. And that should have been the end of the entire thing. So Captain Hitchcock is laying in bed. Sure enough, somebody starts banging on his door. So he pops up, goes to check the door. There's nobody there. Looks down the hallway. Nobody there. That was weird. Whatever. I'm going to go back to bed. Lays back down. Five minutes later, somebody bangs on his door again. Goes over. Checks the door. Nobody's there. Looks down the hallway. Nobody's there again. He's getting, Shuts the door. He's getting ding dong like ditched. Like he's going to lay back down in bed and waits there for like 30 seconds. Somebody bangs on the door again. He opens the door and all he catches is the ass end of a bunch of cadets yelling tally ho hitch. Okay, now it's on. He was trying to be cool. You guys are being drunk assholes. Now there's going to be consequences. So he goes upstairs. He starts kicking in doors, chewing people out writing down people's names he gets to one room two of the cadets try to hide underneath a blanket and another guy tries to take his hat and cover up his face so he can't write his name down the dude's under the blanket he's like take the blanket off quit fucking around whatever they take the blanket off he sees who they are okay cool dude with the hat won't take the hat off of his face he tries to walk past him he ends up pushing him back into the room and he's like no take the hat off your face so i can see who you are and the dude doesn't do it so he's like take the hat off or i'm going to take the hat off for you and then he rips the hat out of the dude's hands sees who it is, writes down his name, no big deal, goes over to the next room. Now, the logical thing to do here would be to go to bed and deal with your punishment in the morning. However, since they're drunk assholes at this point in time, they decide that since Hitchcock actually touched one of them, that it was an attack on their honor and they needed to retaliate. So they went and got bayonets and knives and pistols and they were going to hunt Hitchcock down and kill him. Cut back to Hitchcock. He's oh, making shit. his way through the barracks. There's drunk cadets laying down in the hallway. It's a complete shit Seems show. Seems like a definite overreaction. Yeah, I mean, it's like, commanding officer just touched you. That's a violation of my honor. He has chosen, he has chosen death bigger rooms it has like 20 cadets inside of it at which point he explains to them that because there's more than 12 of them this technically constitutes as a riot and starts reading them the riot act before informing them that they're all under arrest then after placing all of them under arrest he tells the cadet in charge of this like area or this room that he needs to open up all the foot lockers so he can find all the booze and get rid of it and that cadet is like no thanks and he goes and lays down on the floor and falls asleep at this point fucking <laughs> jefferson davis the future president of the confederacy runs in slams the door behind him holding the door while looking at it and is like guys hide the grog hitchcock's coming and then he turns around and hitchcock's right there and he's like oh 
damn at this point captain hitchcock looks at jefferson davis and is like take your dumb ass it's to like death. something out of like, a fucking okay. comedy movie right there like guys guys he's come oh oh sir yeah it's <laughs> a gomer pile that's a gomer pile like incident right there if i've ever heard one <laughs> yep and then he goes to bed, falls asleep. That's the rest of the story for him. Yeah. Captain Hitchcock literally just told the future president of the Confederacy that it's past his bedtime and he listened. This man is the biggest gangster in the entire story. <laughs> Captain Hitchcock then turns around to the 20 cadets that he was just chewing out, looks at them. They look at him. He looks at them. He looks at the guy that fell asleep on the floor, not respecting his authority. And he's like, I have no idea what to fucking do right now. So he just turns around and he leaves. He walks away. And while all this is going on outside the barracks, there's an active duty private that's on sentry duty over the night. And he's got a drum with him to alert everybody in case like there's a fire or somebody attacks or he just needs everybody to wake up. He has this emergency drum and a bunch of drunk cadets come up to this poor private and are like, hey, give me your fucking drum set. So they steal this private's drum set and just start playing it. This ends up waking up the other officer, Lieutenant Thornton, who goes to investigate what's going on. Apparently at this point, the eggnog riot, mutiny, rebellion, whatever you want to call it, it's really kicked off and the idea is spread that we're going to kill some of the West Point staff because Thornton is immediately stopped by a student that has a fucking sword. To which Lieutenant Thornton is like, what the fuck are you doing? Put the goddamn sword down. And the drunk cadet like grumbles something, throws the sword on the ground and then falls asleep on the floor. Cut back to Captain Hitchcock, who has an angry mob of students hunting him and he has no idea. He's come up on another room of cadets that have barricaded themselves into their room and he's trying to kick the door down. And he finally kicks the door in and one of the cadets pulls a pistol and fires. And at the last second, one of the other cadets hits the pistol up and the bullet hits the door frame right next to Hitchcock. And Hitchcock is like, holy shit. Okay, things are getting out of hand. It's time to go get help. Cut back to Lieutenant Thornton who oh, just no. got done dealing with the cadet with the sword. And then he hears a gunshot and he's like, what? the fuck is happening right now so he goes to investigate that <laughs> and on his way there one of the cadets hits him in the head with a piece of firewood and knocks him unconscious so hitchcock makes his way out of the barracks Damn. he's going to find help he runs into private james overton because he was looking for him and james overton is like hey your cadet stole my drum set what the fuck to which hitchcock is like yeah well they just tried to kill me so obviously things are out of control why don't you go get the comm now when he said go get the comm he meant commodore william worth however the cadets that were off to the side overheard him and they thought he said the bomb and they took that as he was referring to the bombardiers which if you don't know west point wasn't just a college at this point it was also an active military base and on that base was a bunch of bombardiers or artillery men and the cadets and the artillery men absolutely fucking hated each other and had this huge rivalry and in the cadets drunken stupor, they took that to mean that the artillery men were going to show up and start like shelling the barracks or at least like try to attack them somehow. So they spread the word and all the drunk cadets start fortifying their barracks for an attack. They're putting all the furniture in front of doors. They're breaking out all the windows. Oh they're loading gosh. whatever guns they what have. The they're getting ready for an actual fight. It is at this point that Captain Hitchcock hears the bugle playing, meaning that it's time for everybody to wake up or so he thought because he turns around and realizes that a bunch of drunk cadets had stolen the bugle and we're playing it too. <laughs> hey, the bugle that's playing in the background does sound like someone drugs playing. He's like... <laughs> like, barfs into the bugle itself. Oh my god, that's... Ugh. Then just kind of stands there for the next couple hours watching all the cadets fortify the building for an attack that's never coming as they break out windows, ruin a bunch of furniture, and then eventually they all get quiet and pass out drunk waiting for this attack to come that never actually comes. <laughs> so then the real bugle does actually kick off and all the other people start showing up. There's a couple of barracks that weren't actually involved. All those cadets start showing up. The rest of the staff, superintendent there, and everybody is like, what? the fuck happened there's broken glass everywhere there's mutton vomit all over the place there's Whoa. drunk privates out in the field with a drum set like what is happening so then captain hitchcock goes over talks to thayer explains everything that happened and he's like what do you want me to do and thayer the dude that knows everything like total hard ass he's like totally in charge even he's like I have no idea. So they just kind of go about their day like nothing happened. And then slowly over time, they kind of figure out, okay, well, we have to do something. So they launch a little internal investigation. They figure out that there's like 90 cadets involved in this riot. And 90 is like roughly a third of all of West Point. So obviously they're not going to be able to kick out everybody. So they decide they're just going to take like the top 20 worst offenders and they're going to expel them. And like all but two of them were invited back the next year. So basically it was just a for show punishment. Some of the more notable names of people that were 
were expelled include Hugh Mercer, who ended up being a general for the Confederacy in the Civil War. Then you had Samuel Roberts, who ended up being the Secretary of State for the Republic of Texas. You've got hmm. Benjamin Humphreys, who was expelled, who ended up being also a Confederate general and the governor of Mississippi. Uh, Jefferson Davis famously didn't get a punishment at all. And then you had uh, John Campbell, who they tried to expel, but he argued his way out of it, and he went on to sit as a Supreme Court justice later in life. Which, I mean, you have to admit, between a bunch of future Confederate wow. leaders getting in trouble for a grog mutiny and a future Supreme Court justice arguing his way out of his punishment, it's some of the best examples of foreshadowing I've ever seen in my entire life. In conclusion, yeah. the moral of the story is that if you're going to do the wrong thing, do it with a lot of your buddies because they can't get all of you in trouble at the same time because teamwork makes a dream work, even if the dream is to be an asshole on Christmas Eve. Thank you for watching. Best yeah. way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Happy Christmas, Merry, whatever the fuck you celebrate. Quack, bang, out. I'm gonna go drink some eggnog. Of all the things you could drink, eggnog. Well, that was completely you know, ridiculous. Like I'm okay with eggnog, but there are other things during Christmas. Like, good sweet brandy on Christmas? Oh, baby, give me that. Like, sitting in front of a fire, sipping on a little bit of brandy, just, oh, that's the best thing ever. Because the brandy gets you. It... <laughs> oh, that's fine. I've never tried the brandy, though. It's sweet, and it is so good. When... Especially good brandy. Not the shitty brandy that they try and pass off as brandy. No, that is whiskey with flavor in it. That yeah, with a flavor in it. The only brandy I've had so far was ass. Yeah. Uh, most brandies out there are just people watering down whiskey with, like, flavorings. That's all, it, that's all they do, and it's bullshit. That is not brandy. Gosh. I'd rather sip cognac than have to try to sip that bullshit. Ugh. I mean, to be honest, I'm pretty sure I could put flavoring in whiskey and make it better than whatever that brandy shit was that I tried. Probably. I can make, like, some blackberry syrup and just put it in some whiskey Ooh. and it'd probably be pretty good. <laughs> that would be nice. That'd be very, very nice. Maybe we can make that a cocktail of choice to go along with your Mitsuri. Uh, a Mitsuri. It's the salted watermelon thing that I told you about the um, last time I told you about it. You're like, I want one, but not right now. Yeah. Have you ever, did you make it? No, because you never told me when to make it. Oh. Um, but he can make, make it for it you anytime. Weekend. Okay. There we go. So, hey, we can plan. Kate's going to try the I'm Mitsuri. Saturday. Huh? Saturday. Okay. Uh, but yeah. I haven't been drinking. I'm just tired. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> and uh, I'm also really sunburnt. So. Yeah, Kate's. A lot of people were asking, like, if Kate was okay. Like, there, there were people just being like, is Kate all right? Is Kate okay? And I had to explain, is like, Kate has worked her ass off. And not only that, but recently she's been dealing with, like, sunburn and just a overall exhaustion. I've been pressure washing. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the middle of the heat. Like blazing sun. And I I used to be really tan and be out in the sun, but I've been I am pasty white yeah. right now. You be pretty tan now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Me, I I tan easily. I, I tan really easily. I don't burn that much. That's that's my thing. I that's that's something me and my mom both have, and my dad. I only ever get a tan on my left arm from driving my car. <laughs> <laughs> you got a driver's tan. Mm -hmm. uh, what sucks is that I have sunburn over my... I don't know. Is is it bad to get a sunburn over your tattoo? Not really. You make it fade. But you make it fade? Oh, shit. It's usually only if you get it several times. Yeah, it's like... Uh, well, uh, any overexposure to UV light will have an effect on tattooing. But eventually, I almost everyone has to get their it. tattoo, like, you know, touched up anyway. So, I mean, yeah. it's not that big of a deal if it fades some. Well, yeah, it's like those bodybuilders that go to, like, Muscle Beach all the time. They've talked about how, like, with tanning and everything out on the beach. As you can tell, I kind of need this touched up. Yeah, it's faded a little bit. It still looks so, good. Well, I've had it for... Over ten years now, so somebody's gonna have to take a picture of my back because I can't see it. Okay, I can do that. Uh, I'm gonna say I I don't have any tattoos. I've I've never had the. I got two. I guess I do need to get this one touched up. Yeah. So I wash my hands a lot. 
Well, yeah, there's that. I don't know what kind of tattoo to get. I really don't. I mean, I was thinking about, like, I was thinking about something, you know, like a, like an armband, but I, I really want to get my arms in better shape before I try that. I'll get a God of War tattoo. You, the, the Omega symbol? I don't know. Or Kratos or something. Well, maybe. Or the axe. Ooh, the axe would be nice. So I always kind of wanted, like, if I ever... I mean, technically, I have a job now where I could do it, but, I mean... I don't know, I've kind of thought about getting, like, a sleeve that's just, like, all, like, awesome weapons from different video games that I like. That'd be cool. I know for you, uh, you know, you'd probably use, you'd probably get, hmm, what's a good one? You'd probably get, like, the silenced pistol from, like, Metal Gear Solid. Hmm. Uh. Or would you prefer something else from MGS? I don't know, I think the more likely thing I would probably do would be, like, the, um... Oh, you could do Raiden's Katana. Yeah. The, I forget what exactly it's called. Like Muramasa? The, high, the high frequency blade. Yeah. I, no, the Muramasa, that's uh, that's Sephiroth. Yeah. Uh, but I was thinking about doing like a Buster Sword in the Mur Muramasa. Nice. And then yep. um, like the uh, Soul Edge from Soul Calibur. That'd be cool. Uh, Dante's. Um, Rebellion. Yeah, either Rebellion or uh, Alastor. Ooh yeah. How about you, Kate? What's a tattoo that you're that you've thought about getting? I know I you have. have I know you. Ha well, well, I know you got the two. No, uh, what I, I I have several tattoos oh, that I want to get. Okay, sorry, sorry. What's one uh, if you if you want to share it, or you don't have to if you don't want to. Um. Well. Uh, I want to have my daddy's last. Um, signature it said love ya dad oh um i want to have that on my left hand okay my left wrist that'd be nice and then there's a harry potter one and dragons and all kinds of stuff <laughs> too many to mention that's fair i don't know like I've never had an idea of like what a good tat what tattoo would look good on me. I don't know. Maybe one here. It's just like it's like cut here, like across my throat. What? I'm joking. I'm joking. That's 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 a joke. I would probably get one. I'd probably get one just like I don't know. There's I'd have to really think about it because. If I'm gonna yeah, put something yeah. permanent on me, I I want it to be something that means something. It uh, took me a long time to actually decide that I wanted something because I was always kind of under the pressure. I was like, "There's nothing I really like enough to get a tattoo of it." Mm. It was whenever I read the In Keeping Secrets Silent Earth comic that I was just like, "I'm getting a key work." And there it's you like, go. That's the answer. <laughs> It's like, cause even if like I end up not liking the band in the future, if they do something I don't like, it's just you know it's an Amory Wars tattoo. It's the specific part of the band's lore that I will always like. So yeah. Well, anyway, I guess that's gonna do it for this one. So we hope that uh, you all enjoyed the fat electrician doing his thing, and uh, yeah, I guess if you all want to see more from the fat electrician. Click his name in the title of the video, which should be right below Kate's, like, blanket right over there somewhere. And uh, if you all want to see more from us, hit that subscribe button, because it really helps us out. And be sure to leave a like, because, hey, if you want us to keep doing fat electrician videos, it's the only way it's going to keep happening. But, till next time, I'm Nate. Kate. Sorry. Nick. <laughs> she just took a drink. I didn't see her taking a drink, sorry. <laughs> And we'll see you in the next one, everybody. Bye-bye.